Our next speaker is Professor Richard Bryan. Professor Bryan is a science here, uh, professor in the School of Psychology in the University of New South Wales, um, Senior Principal Research Fellow and Director of the University of New South Wales Trauma Stress Clinic. His research is focused on understanding and treatment of post-traumatic stress and he has conducted many experimental, biological, longitudinal and interventional studies of traumatic stress. He has served on committees for the recent DSM-5 and ICD-11 Diagnostic Guidelines for PTSD. He consults with many international and national agencies, including the World Health Organization, the UNHCR, the Australian Defence Force and the Department of Veterans Affairs. He has been awarded numerous research awards, including the International Society of Traumatic Stress Studies Robert Loffer Award, the Australian Society of Psychiatric Research Founders Medal, and the Australian Psychological Association's Lifetime Achievement Award. He has served on both the DSM-5 and the ICD-11 workgroups that have written the Traumatic Stress Diagnostic Guidelines. The professor has published four books, 60 book chapters and 420 journal articles. The professor's presentation is entitled the understanding of the nature of PTSD. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Richard Bryan. Hello everybody, and uh, thank you again to the organisers and to Tony for inviting me here. It's a great meeting. I've got the simple task of talking about the nature of PTSD in 30 minutes. Um, this is what I've spent 20 years working on, so you can imagine my frustration. Um, I know there's a lot of uh, people here from very different backgrounds and it's easy for me to give a talk that's going to sound like ancient Greek by overwhelming you with a lot of scientific jargon. So essentially what I want to try and do here is give a sense of what we think PTSD is. How do we understand the mechanism of it? And all this research that people like me are doing, what difference does it actually make to people who actually experience the condition? And how is it shaping how we're trying to help people better in the future? To understand PTSD, we've got to understand what the essential stress response <coughs> is. And this is a stress response that is not a pathological response. It's what we all have whenever we get stressed. If you're walking along and you just happen to sort of stumble across a snake, as a survival mechanism, we are going to respond in a certain way. Basically, this information, you're going to see it, it's going to go up to the visual part of your brain and it's going to trigger down to something called the amygdala. The amygdala is an important part of the brain, which is essentially the fear centre of the brain. And that's going to then kickstart a cascade of stress responses. Now, the basic stress responses are actually not basic, they're complicated, but they're essentially two systems. There's a noradrenergic system, I'm starting to get complicated now, I know, and a cortisol system. But these two things interact. And when they go into hyperdrive, that's when we actually start to get very, very stressed. These are the stress responses that you can all relate to. Now, I want to explain to you what I think is the basic model of PTSD that's driven 80% of the research in this field. And it's called the fear conditioning model. If any of you are psychology students, you've seen this a hundred times. If you're not, here's what you would have learned if you'd done psychology. <laughs> this is a basic experiment that goes on in our lab. And I'm telling you this because this has driven so much of the PTSD work. <coughs> if we put a rat in a chamber and we give it an electric shock, and at the same time we turn an electric light on, that rat is going to learn something powerful. It's going to learn that every time that light comes on, it's going to get scared. And why is it going to get scared? Because that light is no longer just a benign light. It's signalling something. It's signalling a threat. It's signalling it's about to get zapped again. And so what's going to happen is we're not going to shock the rat here anymore. We're just going to turn the light on, but it's going to have freezing, potentiated heightened startle response its heart rate, its blood pressure, its stress hormones, they're all going to get released. These are the things that we do when we see the snake. And this is essentially how all species respond to stress. Now, this is essentially, as simple as it is, has been the foundation for how we understand trauma. For example, if you think about a soldier 
who, for example, gets exposed to a sniper attack. When he's in the field and he hears the gunshot, and he may have a, a, a comrade who's, who's wounded, that's a little bit like the electric shock that the rat gets. That's the initial uh, ping of the whole thing. That's what kickstarts the fear. And the rat's initial fear is like the initial fear that this soldier has when the, um, the gun goes off. Now, it may be months later, he's back home. And just like when a light appears for the rat in the chamber, imagine that soldier is just um, back home and he hears a, a car backfiring. Now that car backfiring is a reminder because what happened, that is actually signalling something in his brain, in that same part of the brain that has learned that this is a reminder of threat. And for somebody with PTSD, they've learned that this threat is actually warning him from a survival point of view that something bad is about to happen. And so just with the rat, that there's going to be fear behaviour, so with uh, somebody with PTSD, there's going to be re-experiencing. The sort of stuff that we saw in Rakesh's um, video at the beginning of the day. Now this has led to, I don't expect you to be expert in this, but just to give you a sense, this has led to an enormous amount of understanding on our part about how the brain um, understands PTSD. And basically, whenever we get exposed to something traumatic, what happens is our central fear responses, could be fear, pain, discomfort, that gets associated with all of the things that go on at the time of the trauma. It might be the sounds of, of gunfire, it might be the smell of um, petrol, it might be the, uh, the, the vision of blood. All of these things get associated in this part of the brain called part of the amygdala. And that then projects to another part of the amygdala that then projects to all the fear responses. The short story is that we have learned from the rat studies and then we've been able to take this into the human domain and into the cl clinical domain, so we've been able to map very, very clearly what are the neural, the brain pathways by which people are developing PTSD. Now, the next part of the story, this is the sort of last part of theory I'm going to hit you with, is something called extinction learning. And this is a really important part of the whole story. Because we know that if we keep putting that rat back in the chamber and we keep putting the light on, but we don't shock it anymore, we just put the light on, new learning goes on. And what happens is new learning is actually overriding the initial learning. So that rat is learning that that light is no longer signalling danger, it's now signalling face safety. And so now I'm okay. And essentially, what we understand now is that for most of us who go through trauma, we undergo this thing called extinction learning in the weeks or months after a trauma. So for example, the soldier coming back um, from, from duty, who's uh, been in, say, a, a sniper attack, yeah, he might hear lots of um, cars backfiring, he might hear the kids screaming, he might have these unexpected noises. Every time that happens, that's a new trial, or a new learning experience that I'm not getting hurt. I'm actually safe. And each time that happens, the brain is rewriting the script, if you like. And so that memory is being rewritten that I'm actually safe. And that is how most people get over trauma. And in a sense, we know from a lot of work, and this is just a couple of studies, not of uh, uh, soldiers, but of rape and non-sexual assault. We know that if we can actually track people over time in the weeks after trauma, lots of people following rape or non-sexual assault, they've all got PTSD-type um, symptoms in the initial days. But if we're not treating them, but they're just getting exposed to all these reminders, but nothing's hurting them anymore, extinction learning is going ahead over time. As most people learn, I'm okay. And so what that means is we do understand essentially that PTSD is failed extinction learning. That's the basic model. I just wanted you to sort of get a sense of, of sort of how we understand the brain is underpinning what's going on. And we can really have made enormous advances in terms of understanding, and this has driven so many of our treatments. Now, let me say that humans are a lot more complex than rats. <laughs> 
Um, and I do want to emphasize that. It's not as simple as this. So issues about guilt, moral injury, lots and lots of other factors that go on interpersonally. A rap model doesn't explain that. But it still has helped us enormously in terms of getting us to where we are today. And the last bit of the model is the neurobiological model. Because what we know is that that new learning, that extinction learning, requires a particular part of the brain. And it's called the medial prefrontal cortex. And essentially what this part of the brain does, it regulates or inhibits this fear, set, fear part of the brain called the amygdala. And if there is one robust finding we have in brain imaging and PTSD, and there probably is only one robust finding we have over many, many studies, is that this is stuffed. The medial prefrontal cortex is not being activated enough in people with PTSD. And that means that we're getting excessive amygdala fear reactions. And that's resulting in people still feeling that threat and trauma and vulnerability is going on now. The trauma is not in the past. It's still in the here and now. And that's really driving again how we're trying to augment treatments so we can help people better. Now moving on to what we know about PTSD. Sandy alluded to this a fair bit in his talk, and that is the field has grown up a lot in the last 10 years in so far as we do know now that the course, the trajectory of PTSD is actually very complex. When I got into this field, it was very simple. You had PTSD or you didn't. Um, but what we know now is that it's actually a, a lot more complex than that. The study that uh, Sandy alluded to, um, our group did across Australia with over a thousand people, one of the um, findings we got from this was that when we looked at people with PTSD, or what we called subsyndromal PTSD, that is, you didn't quite meet the criteria, but you had sort of middle PTSD, or people with no PTSD, was interesting because when we looked at these people over two years, the rates of PTSD stayed the same. But if we looked at who those people were, it changed dramatically. And so when we looked at you know, people, how they changed, basically in each category, if you like, only half the people who had PTSD or subsyndromal PTSD at any time point had it at the next time point. Everyone kept jumping all over the place. And what that told us is that this is a very dynamic, fluctuating problem. And so it's not enough for us to simply say, yes, we can just capture somebody at you know, four years post-deployment and say, you've got PTSD, let's deal with it then. Because you might be saying, okay, you're capturing that person with PTSD then. But, catch that person six months later, their story might be very different. And that's where I do support what Stan Paul is doing in terms of, you know, focusing on PTS rather than PTSD. Because it is a much more nuanced and a more intelligent way of actually understanding the condition. And the field has actually caught up with this. What the field is doing now is using something, and I won't bore you with the statistics of it, but it's a sort of statistical model where we're ditching um, diagnosis altogether. And we're actually looking at severity of stress response. And by doing this, people have been able to model very reliably different trajectories. And people over about five or six studies now have identified there are some core trajectories that people follow after trauma. Now, this is the most critical one to observe and over studies, and this is including large military studies such as the Millennium Cohort study. Every study finds that about three quarters of your sample will always be resilient. And we mustn't lose sight of that. Most people are resilient. And you will find this in the most traumatized group of people. We work with refugees, we work with torture survivors, we work with all sorts of people. And it doesn't matter, there will always be a group, a large group who are resilient. But you will find people up here who are very distressed and chronically distressed. But it's not that simple. You've got some people whose conditions worsen over time and some people who get better gradually over time. And one of the key messages that we've learned from our research is that you're only going to sometimes know what trajectory somebody is on by actually what's going on further down the line. 
because it's not simply what happens on deployment that's going to affect my post-traumatic stress. It might be a year later, how are things are going at home? Do I have a job? How's my relationship with my wife? Is my kid on drugs? I mean, there's all sorts of factors that are going to come into play that is going to impact on how I'm travelling. And this has made it a more complicated way of um, understanding it. But thanks to this form of modelling, we can actually start to understand people in a much better way. Now, I thought we can't possibly go through this talk without talking about mild traumatic brain injury. Because in terms of understanding the nature of PTSD, I think it's fair to say the biggest controversy in the field, in the military domain, has been the issue of mild traumatic brain injury, um, particularly since the Middle East conflicts. Many people have called it the um, signature injury of the war. I remember about a decade ago, I was in the States on Remembrance Day, and I remember turning on the TV and CNN and all the, all the networks were having massive coverage of it all. And there was no mention of deaths, amputations or burns. It was all mild TBI. That's what all the coverage was about, which I thought was just quite astounding. Going back to the study that uh, Sandy reported on our, on our injury people, it's an interesting group that because over 40% actually suffer a mild traumatic brain injury. Now, what we noticed, as Sandy said, we noticed a lot of different disorders, not just PTSD. But when we looked at people who had mild traumatic brain injury, or did not, we noticed an interesting trend in that people with mild traumatic brain injury tended to have worse disorders, or they were more likely to have a disorder. And in fact, when we controlled for other factors, like the severity of their injury and things like that, we actually noticed that things like PTSD were significantly more likely to have PTSD if you actually had a mild traumatic brain injury. And that's a very interesting notion because it's not so simply that we're talking about a medical condition here in terms of a neurological insult, but we are talking about having <coughs> the risk of PTSD being elevated as a result of something going wrong with knock your head. Now, there's numerous mechanisms why this might be the case, but one that we've put forward is that one of the things that commonly happens in these forms of injuries is that you do get this injury to this part of the brain around the medial prefrontal cortex. Now, remember, that's the part of the brain I was just talking about that's critical for extinction learning. It's critical for regulating our emotions. It's possible. It's what's happening in a mild traumatic brain injury is that the very part of my brain that I need to be regulating emotions after trauma, it's compromised. And that's putting me at greater risk of actually developing PTSD. Now that's speculative at the moment, but it is something that we're trying to look into. But associated with the story of mild traumatic brain injury is the whole issue of post-concussive syndrome. Now these are the symptoms that everyone's been so excited about over the last 10 years. Um, militaries around the world have been particularly excited saying that this is going to be a major, major impediment to people. Um, these are things like dizziness, sensitivity to light and sound, memory problems, etc. Now this has been incredibly controversial. Um, some people have argued that this is purely a function of uh, neurological insult. Other people have said, no, it's actually more a function of just psychological stress. Well, just to give you an example of one study, we did a study um, embedded in the larger one that Sandy was talking about, where we looked at patients um, in hospital on a number of uh, neuropsych measures, but also on PTSD measures, and then we assessed them three months later. And we looked at a whole group that did not have mild traumatic brain injury and a group that did. And when we looked at them in hospital, when you actually look at the incidence of post-concussive syndrome, it's exactly the same, both in a hospital and three months later. It didn't matter whether you actually had PTSD, whether you had mild traumatic brain injury or not. The rate of symptoms was the same. And when we looked at what predicted whether you had post-concussive syndrome, it's the pain you're in and the stress that you're going through. It's not whether you actually got a mild traumatic brain injury. And this is actually consistent with a lot of sports psychology um, work where most of the, the activity is in this area. 
Now, it's not to say that the, or the neurological insult is not significant. I'm not, I'm not saying that. But I am saying that the psychological stress component is critical. And this is where the research is starting to inform policy and practice, because the last thing we want to do is inform militaries that if somebody has had a blast injury, for example, that really what we need to be focusing on is neurological insult. But rather, we can actually be helping a lot of post-concussive syndrome by addressing the stress response. Just to give you an example of this, I've been involved with um, something called the Strong Star Consortium, which is a large um, research endeavor in the US. This is a study that um, we did um, of US troops who were exposed to blast injuries. And what we did was that we were looking at uh, what contributed to post-concussive syndrome. And basically, to cut a long story short, the biggest contributor was level of PTSD symptoms. Other factors, now mild TBI was also a significant predictor, but it was mainly post-concussive symptoms. That was the main predictor of, um, sorry, PTSD symptoms were the main predictor of my post-concussive syndrome. Now what people are doing now is we're trying to understand from a more uh, neurological basis, what is, how do we explain the, uh, the nature of this post-traumatic stress versus mild traumatic brain injury. And so, let me just briefly mention a study that we've just done where we've um, used a form of brain imaging called um, diffusion tensor imaging, which is a, a, a neat way to actually look at very microstructural integrity of white matter tracks in the brain. And this is a nice way to actually look at how has the brain been affected following mild traumatic brain injury. This was a study of 130 people, um, civilians, not military. And essentially what we found in this study was that, that, I should say that what we did in this study was we had a large cohort of people with mild TBI, a separate group with PTSD, and a separate group who were healthy but had been through trauma. And essentially what we found was that the mild TBI and the PTSD group, they both suffered um, compromised white matter integrity, if you like, in a number of key regions in the brain. Both seem to be implicated there. And I think the short story here is what it's telling us is that both are important, but don't discount the psychological. And where we need to go as a field, we need to understand how these are interacting if we're actually going to <coughs> help people overcome these problems better. Now let me talk a bit about treatment. I'm not going to talk about much because I don't want to steal the fun of Dave Forbes who's going to just focus on treatment when he talks. But going back to extinction learning, I just want to make the comment that exposure therapy um, <coughs> is the essence of how we treat PTSD. It is without doubt got the strongest evidence. The thing about PTSD is one of the few conditions where psychological treatments um, trump meds hands down. Um, it's based on this idea that we're going to repeatedly expose you to that reminder of the traumas until the point you learn that it's no longer um, threatening. And so it's getting that part of the brain, that medial prefrontal cortex, getting it operating so that it's actually regulating the amygdala properly. That's what we're wanting it to do. Now, this model has actually opened up a number of um, interesting intervention techniques. One I can just... Um, mentioned that I think is interesting is, is the role of morphine. And I'm mentioning this because of a recent study in the military. Now morphine is interesting because morphine <coughs> actually reduces norepinephrine production. Now norepinephrine is part of that noradrenergic system that I spoke about earlier. It's one of those stress responses. And the more that gets released, the more it consolidates the trauma memory. Now what morphine does, it actually reduces that particular neurotransmitter being released which means, it should theoretically, mean that we're going to reduce how much that memory is consolidated just after a trauma. And in fact, when you look at fear conditioning in rats in studies in the laboratory, that's exactly what happens. Remember that rat we had that we were shocking? Give that a shot of morphine, it's not going to have as much fear conditioning. What we did in a study, um, we actually tracked uh, patients who'd come through the hospital and we looked at their long-term PTSD. And we found that basically the rates of PTSD months down the track 
was strongly influenced by the level of um, morphine you got. That is, the more morphine you had in the first 48 hours, the less likely you had PTSD later. This was subsequently followed up by a very large study by the US military um, in the Middle East, where again they found that troops who were given very, very acute um, morphine after injury, they also had much lower PTSD um, following deployment. Now, Sandy, Rakesh, they've mentioned the idea of how do we actually start to tailor treatments? How do we try to identify what is the right treatment to the right sort of um, person? Sandy mentioned that we've got some pretty good treatments, but that no way are they working well enough. One question we asked ourselves is, can we predict who will respond to this exposure therapy the best we've got? Is it informed at all by the models that we have? So is it, a, is it predicted simply by the size of your brain? It's a very simplistic question. But what we did is we had PTSD um, patients, and we've done many, many clinical trials in our particular um, uh, center. And we often do genetics and um, brain imaging studies in association with those tr trials. In one study, we had PTSD patients. We actually just um, put them in the MRI to measure brain volume. And then they got eight sessions of exposure therapy, or cognitive behaviour therapy. And essentially what we found, um, these are just pretty pictures, but essentially what that is, it's that, that part of the brain is called the rostral anterior cingulate, and that's adjacent to the medial prefrontal cortex. It's that same part of the brain I mentioned earlier. And essentially that part of the brain that's critical for regulating emotion, simply how big that is in your brain, how big it is, the size of it, that's going to influence how well you're going to respond to this type of treatment, which makes sense because I need that part of the brain working well if I'm going to respond to treatment. Can we predict um, who's going to respond to PTSD by how my brain is functioning? Not just how big it is, but how it actually works. And here we use something called functional um, MRI, which is essentially looking at the brain activity while I'm doing something. And um, here we often get people to look at things that create fear um, in people with PTSD. And what we did was we had people look at um, fearful faces or neutral faces, and this is a common paradigm in PTSD work, Then they got their treatment. Then we looked at how well they did. And essentially we got a very strong finding again. This is the amygdala on both sides of the brain. And what this tells us, tells us here is that if I'm actually very, very reactive to fear, before I go into treatment, then I actually have a poor prognosis. I'm not going to respond that well to treatment. And so this is starting to tell us that, okay, maybe these people are not going to respond that well to exposure therapy. Maybe they need something different. We've also been doing work with genetics. Now, this is very um, tentative work. Of course, the, the sample sizes are relatively small because you do need huge sample sizes when you start talking genetics. But again, um, we looked at something called the serotonin transporter, which has been studied enormously in, um, in psychiatry. And it's particularly interesting because particular alleles or, or variants, if you like, of this gene, it has been associated with fear conditioning and the extent to which the amygdala is reactive. And essentially what we found was that um, people with a short allele which has been known to be associated with a lot of um, psychiatric disorders, if you actually have that variant of that gene, you will not do so well in exposure therapy. <coughs> We've also looked at something called BDNF, which stands for brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Now, stay with me on this. This is a very interesting line of work because this particular um, neurotransmitter. It's pivotal in terms of um, associative learning. And by associative learning, I mean essentially it's how we put things together. Now, when we talked about fear conditioning, that's what that is. It's learning that one thing goes with another. And to do this, we actually need the a very, very um, tiny parts of the brain um, being in fluid state. And that's what this allows that to do. It's absolutely critical for this sort of learning to occur. <coughs> 
Now we know that if somebody is um, has impoverished BDNF, then they, we, we know that both animals and humans, they are not going to have good extinction learning. So it's quite probable that people who actually have a variant of this gene, which means that they're going to have less of this neurotransmitter, they won't do that well in exposure therapy because it's relying on extinction learning. And so again, we, we um, had our patients, we um, treated them with CBT, we, we uh, took their, their measured their genes, and again, we found that people with this particular allele, this variant of the gene, they did not do that well in treatment. Now, these are small numbers. I agree with what Sandy said, that if we're going to actually take on this sort of work in genetics, we need to do it internationally. And we're doing this at the moment. My group is part of an international consortium where we're contributing all our genetic data um, some very large samples. So we've currently got 40,000 people in a very, very large data set. Now with that sort of number um, across the entire genome, um, we can actually start to understand a bit more what might be the genetic risks involved with PTSD. Um, unless we get up to those sorts of numbers, then we're very quite limited. I'm going to finish with just this one point about how we can actually learn from um, this sort of very basic science. The BDNF is, is, is very important because, as I said, it's going to actually encourage learning. It actually encourages growth in the brain. That's why in the areas of dementia and depression, everybody's very excited about this particular um, BDNF. One of the very cool things about it is that one of the very simple ways to stimulate BDNF is by brief exercise. By simply running for like 10 minutes hard, you will actually stimulate a lot of BDNF in your brain. And that can actually increase learning. We know this through studies. And we know from studies in rats that we can actually increase extinction learning by getting a rat to actually run just after it's done its extinction learning. So can we actually improve exposure therapy by getting a patient to just run for, or cycle for 10 minutes after doing their exposure therapy? We know people don't like taking pills, um, but they don't mind doing hard exercise if it's brief. So we're doing a trial at the moment where we're taking the best treatment we've got, exposure therapy, and we're simply getting people to either do hard or slow exercise straight afterwards. Because maybe this is actually going to help us go from the very um, limited success rate or modest success rate that we've got at the moment to a better success rate in a way that's cheap, cost effective and will probably be friendly to many populations including the military. So let me close here. And just simply by saying that I want to reiterate what a number of speakers have said so far this morning, that we really should be optimistic. We actually know a lot. And we actually do have some very good techniques to help people. We need to do a lot better. We've actually got a very good platform in Australia. We've been doing a lot of good work for a lot, you know, good time. We work collaborative, collaboratively together. Um, I do want to put a plug in that integrating research, so it's not in an ivory tower, but it is, in re it is in the treatment centres, it's in the clinics, it's in the military bases, it's in the VPCSs, it's where, it's where the action is happening. This has to happen. If it's in the, if it's in the ivory towers, in the academic centres, it will be divorced from where it matters. And this is something I think as a country that we do need to be emphasising the future. Thank you very much.